Okay, hello and welcome to episode six of the Death and Decomp podcast. My name is Dr. Amanda Rope. And I'm Dr. Leon Higley, drinking uh, ice water today. English breakfast tea, but a different brand than I normally have. This one has like the the weird silky. Oh, you're giving me a thumbs up? Apparently I did. I don't know how I do that. And it only shows on our screen. So everybody who's watching this doesn't know what we're talking about. Okay, I recognize it. So it went away. Uh, the tea bags that like the weird 3D triangular silky tea bags. Oh. Yeah. It's a different, it's a different brand. My friend brought it over for me. So I'm trying my, my, to stuff. My, my water straight from uh, our um, pump farm there in Ashland where you're at all the way to the city of Lincoln. It's my, yeah. my, my tap water. It's a feat uh, of engineering on a Roman scale. Oh, that was a good, that's good. Feat of engineering on a Roman scale. I, that's a great phrase. I like that. Yeah. So let's talk about engineering feats. I know that some of our uh, viewers, all, all 12 of them, really want to know what's the status on the olfactometer and the ticks? Did, did you get, are you rotting rabbits even as we speak? Well, so I have a rabbit, a rabbit. I have a rabbit thawing as we speak to get ready for experiments to start Monday. So the compressed air got delivered on Thursday. The regulator came on Thursday, and so tomorrow when I get to work Monday morning, I'm gonna hook everything up and hope it works. If it doesn't, we'll use the air compressor. But we're starting tomorrow, regardless of what we have to do. Fantastic. Use. Well, the ticks are here. We have everything we need, so. So how many starving ticks do you have, 200? Yep. Wow. Yeah, 100 males and 100 females. And, and they're American dog tick, right? Dermacenter variabilis? Yep, and then depending on how this setup goes, we'll try the amblyoma, the Lone Star tick. They have been found in Nebraska now, I believe. Well, that's unfortunate. I always, um, I don't put much stock in common names. But the Lone Star tick always bothered me because of Texas. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they have. Did you see the story? Let's see. This would have been maybe three or four years ago about the non-native tick that they found. I think in on a sheep farm in New Jersey. No. So what's the story uh, on this tick? Like we need another one. I know. I know. I know. What was the story on it? It has the potential to carry some disease. It might've been the meat allergy one or something else. I can't remember. Or maybe they're just bigger. Yeah, Is I should probably reread it. But there was, I remember there was a, a non-native tick species that they found on the East Coast, not too terribly long ago in the last five years. And they were they were concerned about it spreading, so. Well, there's so many deer in New Jersey and the whole uh, going going farther north that um, if it gets out and off sheep and onto deer, forget it. It'll be everywhere. Uh, yeah. So it's I don't know. I, for as as much as I dislike ticks, they they do have a fascinating life history and. You just, I mean, you have to give them props for just being so gross. Well, yeah, them and leeches. Okay, I, I guess that's true. Oh, Asian, Asian longhorn tick. So it uh, has long reported, antennae? Reported for the first time in 2017. The female can lay eggs and reproduce without mating. Parthenogenic is what we call that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've been, oh, geez. As of 2022, they've been found in Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. Everywhere. Yeah. Well, that sucks. It says germs spread via bites from these ticks can make people and animals seriously ill. Uh... Yeah. So when you were in grad school, did you, or undergrad, did you take medical entomology? I did. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what tick paralysis is? No. Okay. So I think it only occurs with exoded 
no, have I got this right? Yeah, I think it's only exoded ticks, that 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 group. But for certain people, if a tick attaches sort of at the nape of the neck, there's an allergic reaction that causes a creeping paralysis, which if not cured can be fatal because eventually you'll go into respiratory um, paralysis. But it's a weird thing because the cure is to take the tick off and get rid of those an those uh, antigens and people can recover pretty much overnight. But they're, the cases that they presented when I took medical ant were from the Panama, from Panama at the time, the Panama Canal Zone. So I always thought of the weirdest things to get to have this inexplicable creeping paralysis. And unless you found the tick embedded back there, so another, yet another reason to dislike ticks. Yeah, um, I think they get their name because they have very. It seems like they have very long legs. Oh, it's the legs, not the the long anten long antennae. Yeah, they. I was looking at pictures. They look like normal ticks because they have long legs. I didn't actually look into it. I'm just. Well, that's I'm, even worse. Why are they calling them long horned if they've got long <laughs> legs? God dang it! Maybe because they look like horns when they're questing. That's probably right, Amanda, but it still is a bad common name, in my opinion, like yeah. like many common names. So. Yeah, I agree. There, I do that. It, that's what it's called for for our our listeners that are not super familiar with tick biology. When they hang out on a tall piece of grass or something, and they put their front legs up, hoping something walks by and they snag. It's called questing, which I I actually I think that's a nice term for that behavior. I would be curious about what the mortality rate is what, in, in, a, in a natural setting. How many ticks fail to find a host and die during that questing stage? Because it seems like that should be a high mortality stage. It would, but they can live for so long without a blood meal. Like that's yeah, they have. I mean, they have to because it's so hard to get a host, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure their mortality is relatively high, but they've adapted they have a lot of adaptations to help them work around that so i shouldn't admit to what i'm about to admit on camera but i'm going to do it anyway what is the story about ticks in trees are there tick species that drop out of trees i have heard that i've heard it too but, but i don't but i don't know if it's true and it sounds like an old wives tale to me it does well you know should we should we look it up right now can ticks you're gonna you're gonna GTS it. I am. Um, there's a common misconception that people can unwittingly be exposed to ticks that fall from trees. However, they don't jump, fly, or drop from above. It says. Well, I want you to know that this is an intercontinental misconception because I heard, I had heard or had a question about ticks in trees when I was in Siberia. Uh, let's see. Yep, ambush strategy is questing. Crawl up low shrubs, bushes, or blades of grass. Um, those front legs contain Haller's organs, which are heat and carbon dioxide receptors. Oh, my God. Of course they do. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, they wave them around, try to detect an animal or human going by. So this is, uh, let's see, Dr. Dryden out of Kansas State. Diagnostic Medicine and Pathobio at Kansas State. Well, good. I'm glad yeah. to know. I'm glad to know that my suspicion that that was not true uh, holds up. Do you notice that I have a Rudolph nose on today's podcast? It looks like I've been skiing, which is far from the truth. But I'm going to have to start do start doing some makeup before these these shoots. My your, my nose, public... your nose looks fine on my end. Oh, it, does it? At, see, I still have my like ghost complexion. Oh yeah, you definitely have. And and in fact, your ghost complexion because of I, I guess the lampshade or the something you have a slight green cast. So. Yeah. I, if if I were better, I could fix that in post, but I'm not I'm not it's better. Okay. I'm just rocking the zombie look today. Yep, there you go. That's 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 cool. That's cool. All right. So which which of our two topics of choice did you want to pursue today? I don't care. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you choose. It's well, comfy. I'm relaxed. I just spent four hours dying yarn with my friend using cochineal. So it was cochineal that you used. Yeah. yeah. Crushed so them myself. Actually, I made my students do it. So you crush the cochineal, then does it go into alcohol? No, water. Really? Yeah. And so how deep a red did you get from it? Oh, we got, 
uh, actually, we got a very deep purple. Because wow. we didn't add, so we more danced with alum with with animal protein fibers. It's much easier. You you do get more of a red pink color with cellulose fibers. We were doing cotton and linen this time. It was a cotton linen blend. Uh, if you don't mordant with a tannin and then an alum, so it's like a two-step mordanting process, um, it ends up more purple. So, so cool. And the dye might not fast as well. Like it might not hold as well. well but... so, so for those of our viewers who don't know about cochineal, do you want to, um, you want, you want to explain what cochineal is? Yeah, so cochineal is an insect that feeds on cactuses. Prickly pear. Yeah, prickly pear cactuses. That's right. Uh, Apuncha? Is that the genus? That sounds familiar. That sounds vaguely familiar, but I, I'm no botanist. Uh, and you scrape off. So the females are the ones that are sedentary that are feeding on the cactus, you scrape them off, dry them out. And they're this beautiful, like when they're dry, they look like they have a metallic silver sheen to them. Uh, is it is it wax or is it no uh, pigmentary? It, it, I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, and I did, have no idea. And did you buy your cochineal off Amazon or did you find another yeah. spot? No, I bought it from a a like fiber online fiber company, a wool company maybe or something. Uh, and they they sell them one and a half ounce containers of the dehydrated insects, and then you crush them. So we just used a rolling pin and wax paper and crush them, and you get this really beautiful dark burgundy color powder, and then you can just you hold on to the powder until you're ready to die, and then you just add it to hot water. And we let and it soak uh, about 45 minutes. So I, I, I would like to I'd like to make a cochineal tie. I should get with Phyllis and see if yeah. she if if I um, have some extra. So I, I might look into that. That would be a blast to have a cochineal tie. I think. Yeah. So I um I posted on Facebook a story here to so that'll be the thing i forget to link to today will be this wonderful video on cochineal production and a little bit about the history of cochineal but if i remember correctly they were saying cochineal right now is about 500 dollars a ki kilogram which is a lot of cochineal that is a lot of cochineal the, the global market for cochineal is 35 billion dollars but what I found interesting, because it's still used widely in various foods and cosmetic yeah. products, but what I found most interesting, the story, historically, cochineal comes from Mexico, mm -hmm. but production was introduced to Peru, and apparently in Mexico, they have to rear the scales indoors to prevent parasitism and some other problems, whereas yeah. in Peru, they can do it outdoors on a cactus species that I guess is not prickly pear, but a, a related species. And so Peruvian production is so much cheaper than Mexican production. It's driving traditional oh, um, nice. cochineal producers out of business. So um, I, I found it to be a really fascinating story. How, how are, I assume that in Peru, they, I, I, I don't know for a fact, I guess, but is is it a parasitic wasp in Mexico? I mean, I would assume it's probably a wasp. Um, do they not have that? I assume that's the case that some by, by some stretch. Through. Yeah, I I'd be surprised if they don't have their own uh, parasitoids, but but to some degree they're protected by the those white white waxes they produce. Yeah. But, so um, how I wonder then how. They're, I guess, I don't know, it's probably not a huge deal having insects on cactuses, but I, well, it's I, labor, I can tell you it's labor intensive. You've got to take, you know, I mean, basically you've got to clip off the the cactus and then individually get the cochineal off. So yeah. it's it's not, 
I don't know that there's any mechanized way to do that without I think so. damaging things. I suppose you might, I wonder if a mite brushing machine or something like that might work. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, all the videos I've seen, they hand, they're hand scraping. Yeah, that's what I, that's what everything I've seen as well. Well, we, well, I will post that story for those who are interested in Coach Neal. It has a very interesting history. Coach Neal is the red, is the dye responsible for the red of the red coats. Yeah. And they, was it Carmine? If you yeah, see Car it, like Car Carmine, Carmine is Coach Neal. And apparently it also goes by some, some letter abbreviations as well, which I suppose was a mechanism to hide the fact that there's insect in lipstick or other. Yeah, I've seen it. I've looked at ingredients list. I've seen it on Jellos. Uh, oh, like I should look for Jello that. Cups and um, some Gatorades or it's, like drinks. Yeah, I think people like it because it is um, uh, supposedly a natural product. But I but they mentioned in this story that there were concerns from vegetarians that it was animal exploitation. I'm sorry, but I've got to draw the line someplace. I don't believe it's possible to exploit a scale insect and its hundred neurons or what incredibly small amount of nervous material it has. So, yeah, yeah, it was fun. We we got some some cool colors and patterns since because not all of the not all of the yarn dyes the same, particularly with like cotton linen blends. So. It, we have some really cool ombre, like light lavender to this really deep, like royal purple. So did you get a better color on linen or on cotton? It's a, bl I don't know. It's blended together. So it's Oh, blended. oh, I see. I see. It's mostly cotton, I think. I think it was mostly cotton with a little bit of linen. But uh, yeah, I'm wool all the way. Wool as much as it, because you don't even have to mordant wool necessarily. It, it holds wow. on its own. Yeah. Excuse me, but wool, it's expensive. It can be, yeah. It is. Well, right? un undyed wool is not super expensive. Really? Mm -mm. Oh, I'll look into that. Maybe I could maybe I could make a wool tie then. I, I took a wool, like I took a wool spinning class in grad school. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have like, like I have like bags of fibers that that I could spin at any time. I just haven't. Wow. Mm -hmm. In grad yeah. school. Yeah. I hope that was during your master's degree and not your nope. PhD. Nope. Nope. That was during my PhD. Oh, for heaven's sakes. The I things we something. learn after the fact. I needed something besides Downton Abbey to keep my sanity all those long nights in the lab. I believe that. I completely believe that. Well, it seems down we, we, we've we headed down this path. Why don't we talk about eating insects then as our topic du jour? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. So in previous lectures, we talk about insects eating us, albeit when we're dead, I suppose. Yeah. In the future, we'll talk about insects eating us when we're alive. But before we get there, let's go ahead and talk about inse eating insects. Ticks, ticks, I mean, that's technically eating you while you're alive. Oh, sure. Uh, a little bit. Part it's, more of like, it's more like table service for the tick. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's talk about eating insects. So it seems like every 10 years... I see, and I'll see stories. I'll see a spurt of stories about eating insects that transcend the um, news of the weird and and purportedly are serious about insect mm -hmm. protein as an alternative to um, other animal sources of protein. So, Amanda, yes or no? What's your take on this? Uh, well, do we want? Yeah, okay. I do not have an ethical or moral issue eating insects as a source of protein. Yeah, I just think it's a waste of time because people aren't going to do it. That's my... Well, yeah, maybe not, but... Uh, I, I say that for two reasons. I, I, I say that not to disrespect native cultures, but every place, if you look in Mexico... It, it was displaced by Western diet. And if you look in South America, the same thing is true. And I call it the, I think it's the chicken effect. You know, it's when you have enough money to start eating more meat, you eat excess meat, initially chicken, and which is what happened in Southeast Asia. And then if you get have an even higher increase in 
uh, standard of living. You, you start you start going to McDonald's and then watch your heart disease rates uh, begin to resemble Western heart disease rates. And now now Asia eats a, a massive amount of beef, right? Yeah, they sure do. Massive. They sure do. So um, yeah, so I don't have a moral I don't have a moral problem with it. The argument tends to be that it's um, less destructive to the to the environment to produce insect protein than it is to say to produce uh, avian or or beef. But I don't know. Beef's kind of a big target because it it's potentially so environmentally hazardous and it's so expensive in terms of um, yeah. its carbon footprint and um, water it, use water use pollution from both methane but also um, uh, nitrates so there's a lot of problems with it need a lot a lot of land yeah 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 so, i i don't know i guess i think of like there might come a point where you either have to eat them or you're anemic and die right <laughs> like, when like would you when would you ever this is the problem I have with this the insects don't photosynthesize so they're eating plants that's so, true so if you're needing protein why not eat beans instead and just eat the plant that produces the protein why do you why would you still need an intermediate to get the protein well because maybe you don't have enough land or you don't have enough water to grow beans, but the insects you're eating might not just eat beans. They could eat lots of plants. So they could be bioconverting whatever, and then you can eat them. Amanda, okay. what do we, what do we know about the industrial production of insects? What happens every time we try to grow insects in large numbers? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I'm we just, Think of it from like a zombie apocalypse standpoint. I would much rather go out and harvest grasshoppers than like try to grow beans. If a zombie, well, I'd to... rather eat insects than mice. I mean, I, I, oh. I give you, I give you that. But in terms of like industrial production of insects, I don't see it. There's there's all kinds of disease problems. Yeah. That well now now they're saying that insect rearing is the way to go because they can feed on garbage. That's problematic. I mean, how? It, let's say they are feeding on garbage. How on earth are you ever going to sanitize that so you're not having pathogen transfer? I don't, I don't see that. Unless they're really efficient at pathogen destruction on their own, since they're maybe used to feeding on pathogenic things. I don't know. I'm just well, not. Against, I'm not against it. I know. We read that article that was talking about the ethics of eating insects and erring on the side of them, of erring on the side of not eating them because they could have some consciousness, right? That was what the article was talking about. They could be, have some sort of, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess if you're going to, if you are fine with eating animal protein, from an ecological standpoint, it seems like insects might, might be the better choice. But you're right. When you talk about like industrial farming of insects, it's going to just be an industrial farm. Now, the other weird thing I seem to recall was the proposals for using the insects as animal feed. Yeah. I, I for 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 chickens is that the idea that you grow large, grow large quantities of insects and and bioconvert them into chicken flesh or something else? But for the longest time, you couldn't actually put insects in chicken feed. It was against regulations. You could put fish meal in chicken feed, but you couldn't put insects in. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, not from a what chickens eat in the wild standpoint, no. But that that has maybe changed recently. But I know, like ten years ago, you couldn't you you couldn't use insect parts on purpose in chicken in chicken. I I don't know what to make of this quote, and it may not be true. But in the 1870s, when there was the gra huge huge grasshopper Rocky Mountain locust outbreak in the Midwest, um, 
among the letters I letters and papers I read from that period, one person had written that um, their turkeys and chickens tasted like grasshoppers. They'd eaten so many grasshoppers. So I assume that if you're on an exclusively grasshopper diet, maybe it somehow alters the taste of the, the meat? Yeah, maybe. I mean, grasshoppers do have a distinct smell. So maybe they also have a distinct taste. The ones that I've ever eaten are always flavored. Like, they're always seasoned. So it's, I don't can't really say much about their They don't nap. really taste. I mean, I've eaten mealworms. They don't taste like anything. No, they taste uh, like popcorn. They're like air. Mostly air. Yeah, mostly air with uh, bits of exoskeleton that get caught in your teeth. I don't, I mean, that's my biggest problem with a whole lot of them. The exoskeleton gets caught in your teeth. They don't. The legs. What? The legs, are, the legs are a problem, especially, especially for those lithopterans, like crickets and grasshoppers. They oh, have yeah. those, those large jumping back legs, and then they always have spines. Yeah, you got to pull the spine. You got to pull the legs off, the yeah, hind legs anyway. Off. Yeah, yeah. And you're not going to digest the head capsules. I guarantee that's passing right through. Is it fiber, though? Because I just read recently that Americans have awful fibers in their diet. Like, they have almost no fiber in their diet. Well, it's not fibrous. I, I actually, what is the purpose of fiber in your diet? Do you know? To move things more efficiently out, I think. So it's not sitting there causing colon cancer. Well, I, I, you can't do anything with those head capsules. So I guess you could poop out a bunch of head capsules as easy. You could poop out a bunch of corn, corn <laughs> or whatever it is. So now I guess if we're going to talk about what about places, what, what about places that currently eat insects? We should talk a little bit about that. When I was in Thailand, of course, they yeah. all served those giant water bugs on, Ooh, on, on, on a stick. On a stick. I saw street vendors selling them. I didn't, I was on a bus at the time and unfortunately I couldn't stop and get a picture, but I saw from the bus selling, selling that. And I did not avail myself of the opportunity in Chiang Mai, Thailand to go to the insect uh, restaurant, but, but I could have, could have done. You could have. Yeah. I, there's a lot of African countries that eat insects regularly. Lots of places in Asia that eat insects regularly. Uh, indigenous people in Australia and Mexico. Uh, now there's one thing mentioning Australia. I would definitely like to try honeypot ants because that just sounds good to me because basically they're like candies, right? Yeah. Yeah. It would be like a, a mini gumdrop or something. So right? if, if you're not, if, if you're not familiar with honeypot ants, these are desert ants that, um, short, store sugar water in their abdomen. And so essentially it's as if in the colony, some of these ants are just have little ballooned abdomens full of sugar water. Have you seen that picture where they feed them different color sugar water? And so their, their abdomens are like full, you know, they look like these little balloons. Oh my like God. Blue and red and yellow. Now that would be worth having it. If you could have honey pond ant, ant farm that would be a great hobby it would be yeah it's like those flowers that they put in different carnations they put in colored water in it yeah yeah that, that would be totally cool yeah can you buy can you buy honeypot ants or witchetty grubs when you're in australia i don't know i didn't i did not look well i the couple of times i've been over there you can buy regular ants to eat yeah but what do they taste like other than? They're a little citrusy. Like they have a they have a citrusy flavor. I don't know if it's from the formic acid or another type of acid, but yeah, they have like a lemony flavor. I made literal ants on a log one time with like celery and peanut butter and then sprinkled ants on there. I gave it a nice crunch that like raisins don't have. Did you know, I, I didn't know this, but we have a honeypot ant here, I see. I did not know that. Myrmecocystus mexicanus, which are legal to buy in Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, New Mexico, Utah, and Texas. If, if we can get them in Colorado, why can't we have them here? Also, do they skip over Wyoming? I mean, Idaho and Colorado are on 
the top and bottom of Wyoming. So I guess the question is, they're expensive. Let's see here. For one to 25 workers to set up a colony is 50 bucks. Wow. But they are Wait, cool looking. For 25? Yeah. I don't know. It could be cool. It's... No, there's there's a species that occurs in Canada. After the the ant work last year, I have no appreciation for ant diversity. Yeah. I guess the ones in Australia are the giant honeypot ants. That would make sense. That'd be why eating them is more like it is better because they're bigger. I wonder now if you pin a honeypot ant, does its abdomen stay distended or? I think that's an interesting question about what happens. That is an interesting question. I mean, eventually it would probably leak out, right? I would think so. But if the tissue had hardened before it started leaking, maybe it would stay distended? I don't know. That's a tricky I'm, one. What about I'm the finding, I'm finding some interesting websites here for rearing ants. What about the witchy grubs? You want me to look them up? No, I can do that. I'm here. I Which know. The, do you know what they, um, which, I don't, can I spell it? E-T-T-Y. We got, last time, last time we had, during our entomophagy section where I had my students eating insects, we got some of, let me see if I can find them. From Cameroon, I believe, originally. And they are big. Mopani. Mopani worms. Um, they are much larger than I thought they would be. Oh, the and Mopani worms were? Yeah, and they're this beautiful, like, black and yellow. Like, you could still see the uh, pattern on them, even though they were dry. Oh, they are a very pretty caterpillar when they're not dried. Yeah, you can still see some of that coloration. Um, but they were big. They were big, so... So in Australian slash British things, you can buy witchetty grub, jelly, lollies, and gummies. Okay. So they're not real witchetty grubs, obviously, but they're colored to look like that. Mm -hmm. You can buy mixed grubs, but they're mostly as turtle food, apparently. Are there that many people in Australia that have pet turtles? Portal? <laughs> I, I don't know, but for fourteen sixty, I'll tell you what. For fourteen sixty seven, we can get a little pouch that has a witchy grub on it that looks very cool. What are you going to use the pouch for? Uh, pencils for my art journaling. All right, as long as you have. I'm, a I'm not going to get it, but I could. So we can't just buy dried. No, I'm not. I'm not finding them. I, that doesn't surprise me. They um, apparently they get the name because they feed on the roots of something called a witchetty bush. Oh, it's one of those. It's one of those things that, like anything, as soon as people find out how to make money off of them, it you know it just. It becomes like any other industry, and it becomes probably destructive, especially for things like that that are specific to certain plants. Or so now here's something I might buy. I don't. That's um, soy-based candles, but they're in a bag uh, that's made with an Aboriginal pattern 
uh, uh, fabric that's got witchetty grubs and honeypot ants on it. Oh, that's cool. You have, Naturally, you that's have some artwork with witchetty grubs on it. Yes, I do. I have some actually Aboriginal art. No ants. I don't think there's ants that I remember, but I remember the grubs on there. Apparently, there are places you can you can actually eat whip, witchetty grubs in Australia, but it doesn't look like they're sold otherwise. I kind of like that. Like, you have to go there to do it. Yeah, I like that, too. And, of course, they're mostly fat. That's where the white in the grubs have a – our beetle larvae that have a C shape. Um, I'm trying to do that with my finger, sort of a, a, a curved thing. So they take the head off. That's That you're not going to digest for sure. But the rest is going to be um, basically just fat. And they're eaten live, apparently. That's got to be a horrible thing. And witch, witchy grubs are fairly large. So, yeah, you, you wouldn't want to eat the head capsule. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, they're they're basically finger-sized. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, there was, I know that they're, in the United States, to try to, like, it's still very much on the fringe, but to get people more comfortable with eating insects, they would have like cricket powder or protein powder that was made from crickets or mealworms that people could put in their beverages or something because they thought that if Americans couldn't see the insect parts, they would be more likely to eat them. Well, people are but eating like, insect parts on a regular basis. They just don't know it. Yeah, that's true. And my students actually agreed. They, they said yes. It, like seeing the parts freak to them out. Now there's a place in Lincoln that sells insect-based food, right? Do you remember the name of they, that company? They used to, yeah, I don't know if they're still around. They started, there was a couple food science majors from UNL and like maybe a business major or something. I can't remember what they were called, but they used to sell their stuff at high V, I I believe, or online. We went to, they hosted they hosted a dinner. They hosted a dinner at, at the Grand Mass, I think, in downtown Lincoln. It was great. Well, they were called Bug Eater Foods, and I see they still have a Facebook page, but when I tried to go to bugeaterfoods.com, I got the dreaded 404 message. So I'm guessing that they went out of business. Well, that's too bad. Yeah, that is too bad. Yeah, they're they're I think it was a five course meal that we had and the the they so or one of the courses was mac and cheese and the noodles had been made with insect flour and they were sprinkled with I don't know seasoned dried insects or something for a little bit of crunch and they had chocolate covered crickets on ice cream for dessert and I think they had ramen like insect ramen that was actually yeah good. I see that here online as their um... there's also a company out of Canada that you can buy like bolognese sauce like um, spaghetti sauce with crickets or mealworms in it Interesting, interesting. Yeah, my family ate that. They did that did not bother them, even though they knew there were insects in it. Like I think because they were covered in sauce or something, they were fine with it. Well, um, do we have anything else we want to say, or should we call it? What well, what's it your what's your take on eating insects? You ask me. How do you feel about it? I, I don't mind if other people do it. I'm not, I, I, I've had my share. I'm not interested in doing it on a regular basis, but um, no, my, my, my only criticism is that the people who tend to argue for um, mass production of insects, I, it just seems unlikely to me. And I, I also don't, I think my biggest thing is if it's an evolution, if it's because of ecological reasons, then we should be looking at plant proteins because that makes more ecological sense to me than um, insect proteins. But I, but there's a rich history of eating insects in different cultures. And I think that's worth preserving and respecting different people's culinary traditions to a, to a point. I'm never gonna go along with eating cat. That's just uh, inhumane, but. I mean, if I'm starving. 
Well, maybe maybe then, but I don't think that's when. There's, there's, there's certain animals, sentient animals should not be subject to being eaten. So I, so I am opposed, philosophically, morally opposed to eating any of the marine invertebrates like oh, yeah. squids, octopus. an octopus. Uh, okay. I'm not too happy about lobster if I'm being perfectly honest because they... Okay, what about crabs? I don't know enough about crab brains to have a feeling one way or the other. Well, I can't imagine they're significantly less sophisticated than lobsters. Lobsters have some pretty sophisticated behaviors and they're long lived. And so that's a good sign that they would have more involved behaviors. Minimally, I think boiling lobsters is should should be banned. I'm with this, you know, this it's illegal in Switzerland now. And I, I think that's the coming thing that if you're going to eat lobsters, pit them or do do some other humane way to kill them, but definitely not boiling them. Okay, I want to end today talking about two things that have nothing to do with. Well, actually, the fr the first one does have something to do with insects. So there is a new zombie show on HBO Max, I believe, called Last of Us, based on the video game. And received very zombie... good reviews. I've not seen it, but I've seen the reviews. Yeah, it's. I've watched the first two episodes. It's good, and the whole premise is. Uh, cordyceps based fungus, um, opio cordyceps, because I think they changed the genus, but it's the same genus that causes zombie ants. So there's the entomology. Oh. Yeah. And it's talking about in the show, climate change allowed the fungus to adapt to warmer temperatures and like invade human beings. There are some beautiful funguses in the show, uh, just like representations of funguses uh the second thing so i'm just throwing that so that's awesome if, yeah. if you're not yeah. familiar with cordyceps cordyceps is a fungus it's a genus of fungus that uh, grows on the larvae of swift moths and it has many pharmacological properties and is quite a valuable the the the, the fungus itself is quite a valuable commodity to the point that uh, it's a major source of revenue for in some parts of rural Nepal, and from over harvesting of cordyceps, it is that that tradition is under under some stress slash it's threat it's threatened based on overuse. Um, there are among its among its fire its um, pharmacological properties. Cordyceps is a vasodilator. That's cordyceps. Um, Sinensis, I think, but Amanda, you're talking about enough different cordyceps that causes ants to behave like zombies, right? Yeah, yeah. So they they pick it up as they're walking around on the floor and on the rainforest floor, and it causes them to like move down where it's more humid and warm, and yeah, just takes over their behavior. And then you see these ant carcasses with just like crazy fours um just oh man it's so cool okay so that's the other one thing the second thing is that i read an article this also relates to fungus actually i read an article about indoor hydroponic farming in denmark i believe where it is massively successful and they were showing Amanda, are you reading pot magazines? Is that what this is about? <laughs> no, they're, they're growing like tomatoes and lettuce. Okay, okay. So just they, checking. There, there were these pictures of just these massive water tanks growing lettuce. And my question was, and it was not addressed in this article at all, how are they preventing fungal diseases? Because once it gets in the water... Forget it. At, like everything has it and you, draining those those massive tanks and like cleaning all of the circuitry that is pumping that water around i mean funguses are notoriously hard to get rid of well what about and an algae they'll grow everywhere how do they keep the tanks algae free so that's my question like how are they preventing diseases in these 
these hydro these massive hydroponic setups especially with something as wussy as lettuce like lettuce is it's hard to grow because it likes cooler temperatures it like wilts really fast it's just sort of a I, i'm see? i'm betting there's some sort of antifungal thing they're using in the water has to be has to be but then what like what happens when your funguses are like Okay, we're done with that. Yeah, and yeah. They take anyway. Yeah, they did. This they, is a, they this didn't is a very good question. All it right, was, it was a longer read. I'll see if I can find the article and I'll share it with you. They did not talk about how they prevent diseases at all. Not anywhere in the article. And I, the whole time I'm reading it, I'm like, what? How? What are you guys doing to to stop this? Because and tomatoes like also notoriously difficult when it comes to diseases and they were hydroponically growing those on mass in these massive indoor greenhouse spaces maybe they're oh. rotating things so quickly maybe there's a sufficient turnaround that that's a way that they deal with this by not really allowing things to set and, and have it build up the way that might happen in a commercial facility that that's but these are commercial facilities oh well then i don't get it yeah, I, and they're, oh, Netherlands. They're in the Netherlands. They're doing this in the Netherlands, and they're, like, it's making up a massive export. It's well, I know that those export. indoor facilities are nightmares when it comes to insects, white flies and um, scale insects, actually, a variety of things. Didn't um, talk about them at all. And spider mites. Didn't talk about them at all. So I'll send the article to you. Maybe we can loop back around, but... Um, all the, all the whole time, I was just like, "How are you controlling?" Yes, yeah, send send me the if you still got it. Send me the original okay. food article as well, so I can try to post this and and not okay. become notorious for never posting things that we claim we're going to okay. post. <laughs> and and for those of you who've listened to the end, uh, if you wait for after the titles, I'll post a blooper there for you. So <laughs> okay, you can, my, you can keep it at the beginning. It's okay. My my glass is empty. Minus two. Yeah. Okay. Minus. We'll see okay. everybody next week. Thanks, Amanda. Okay. Gotta get my hair. My hair. <laughs> okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Do you want to okay. do the announcement this time or do you want me to? You do. You do it. Okay. What podcast episode are we? Six. Okay. <laughs> are we gonna are we gonna cut this part? <laughs> <laughs> I might leave it in or I'll put it at the end as the bloopers. <laughs>